Welcome to the Animation Podcast, an official podcast of Filmbook. The Animation Podcast is a weekly animation news podcast that reports on the latest animation movie and TV show news. Should old acquaintance be forgot, I'm gonna run out of holiday songs pretty soon, I promise, I'll stop starting these episodes like this. <laughs> oh boy, uh, if you can't tell, this is gonna be a very loose episode. Um, I'm recording this on New Year's Eve right now, um, but you guys will be listening to it two days into the future on uh, New Year's, New Day, New Day twice. Uh, so <laughs> I hope everybody has a happy new year or has had a happy new year and that in the future things are going okay in 2022 um welcome to the animated podcast everybody a weekly podcast about all things animation brought to you by filmbook my name is Ephraim bernie if you are tuning into the animation podcast for the first time what i do on this podcast is i discuss the current week's animation news you can find more The Animation Podcast episodes on Filmbook. That's film-book.com. Uh, using the voice of the guy who introduces me. Uh, you can search that by using the search term The Animation Podcast on our website. Uh, if you are listening to this podcast on iTunes or another podcasting service, please rate and review this episode. If you are listening to this podcast on YouTube, please like our video, subscribe, consider becoming one of our Patreons, patrons on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash filmbook. Leave a little comment on there, uh, telling me what telling me what uh, favorite Beatle I sound like, which one of the Beatles I sound like. Not like the band members, just like if I'm a, a Rhino Beetle or a <laughs> or a Weevil, a Weevil or something like that, some kind of insect. I know that's what I uh, that I what I compare myself to. Uh, <laughs> um, please consider uh, donating on Patreon.com to us. Your support helps us create even more engaging content. Um, this one, guys, <laughs> it's the end of the year. There isn't a ton of news as there is. There's some, there's definitely some, but I wanted to dedicate two special things, right? So in this episode, I will be predicting, I will, I will be not predicting, but I will be telling you what is coming up, what to look forward to in this next year, right? There's so many great films that have already slated for a lineup in 2022, um, I'm going to go over all of them right here with a little help from Cartoon Brew, who has uh, very the, uh, uh, put together a great article explaining and listing all the great things. I've added a couple of them of my own to them as well. Um, and then a little shout out to another video. Um, I will be doing a top 10 list of my favorite movies from this past year, just ranking them and talking about them in depth. A lot of them were movies that came out before I really came on to the show. And so, I don't know, I just wanted to give give some shout-outs to films that I really I really loved. And I'm sure <laughs> if you if you watch, you could you've probably already know most of them. Um, but I don't know, it's it's a nice thing I think and and worth doing. So, I will be doing that in another video that will probably come out within the next couple of days. And look, if that one gets good traction, I can do one for my favorite TV shows from the last year too. And, you know, maybe I'll do one where I talk about 2022 TV shows, but that's a lot of, there's a lot of the same stuff out there. So I figured I'd, I'd focus on the movies this time around. So instead of doing a lot of news, um, I'll do a little bit of news, but for this episode, I'm going to be mostly from category to category. I'll be talking about what you can expect next year and just kind of driving up some hype for 2022 because there's a lot of really good stuff. Um, so yeah, it'll be domestic, you know, domestic big films. That's where the bulk of this is going to be. And then there'll be some anime, a little bit of anime news, not too much. And then there's going to be a um, a good chunk of foreign films that I think everybody should be excited for. And then we'll do a review, and obviously I'll, I'll finish up how I normally do. Um, but let's go into what we have in store for 2022 in the big streaming services, huh? So next year starts off pretty strong. Um, there's a there's a, already a couple ones that are, are right in the beginning of January. The, the big one probably being Hotel Transylvania. Transformania. Uh, <laughs> they made this so I, it would be specifically difficult for me to say. Um, if you guys know, everybody probably knows this already, but Hotel Transylvania comes from Sony. Um, this one's going to be directed by Jennifer Kluska, Kluska and Der Derek Dryman. Um, again, 
<laughs> forewarning with all the names. There's a lot of names, and I'm not going to be great at all of them. Um, this one has me particularly excited. It comes out on January 14th. I haven't I, I haven't watched all of the transfer Transylvania films. I saw the first one, and then I haven't seen the last two. But this one has me particularly excited because, if you don't already know, this one kind of got the internet stirred up for a bit. But Transformania is about all the all the monsters switching sides for a bit, and they become humans, and then the human characters become monsters. Um, there's a crazy little machine, and you get to see what all of these, the very creative ways in which they make these monsters look like people. They made the werewolf with, uh, he's got a beard, that's pretty, I don't know, he looks like, he still kind of looks like a wolf, but he's got terrible posture, he looks like a, you're, he looks like an accountant, <laughs> and, um, the, um, the jello, the blob becomes a plate of jello. And I remember, if you guys remember this, uh, Twitter was totally up in a stir, um, because, the uh, everybody was kind of, uh, kind of hot for the, the invisible man, and then they made him visible, and they didn't like him, they didn't like the way that he looked. Um, so yeah, no, there's a lot of clever stuff that's going on. Um, this one's coming out on Amazon, um, I know a couple of these, uh, Hotel Transylvania films went to Netflix, so some people, uh, might be a little confused with that, but yes, it comes out on January 14th, then, uh, only two weeks after that, you get Ice Age Adventures of Buck Wild, that's January 28th, it's gonna be on, uh, Disney+, Plus. it comes from, uh, 20th Century Animation, and it's just going to be directed by, I've already spoken about this one, but it's John C. Donkin and Marshall Fells Elliott, um, this one, you know, look, if you're an Ice Age fan, you might be a little disappointed because it seems like it's going to be much more of a focus on um, on the, the two little, I always forget their names, but the two little <laughs> possums. They're going down back into the dinosaur underground area where they're going to be hanging out with Buck and kind of going on adventures and trying to... I don't know. It seems much more focusing on their character development. Like, you might like those weasels. Um, <laughs> I, they certainly weren't my favorite part of the movies. I really I really liked that, that core group of Manny and Sid and Diego. Um, so it might be a little bit disappointing, but I don't know. If you're an Ice Age fan, the, this, one's, this one might be one to check out. If you missed Buck Wild, then he's, he's back. Now, here's one that I think you, that we haven't heard too much about, but I'm kind of interested in what we're going to get from it. It's a movie called Luck. Um, it's directed by Peggy Holmes. It's for Skydance, from Skydance Animation. It's going to be on Apple TV+. Plus. It comes out February 18th. Now, the thing to keep tabs on with this is that this is the first film we've gotten from John Lasseter ever since he was uh, kind of ousted um, from Pixar and Disney amid the, the kind of Me Too allegations. Um, we're not really sure if it's actually going to come out on February 18th. We haven't heard much from it, but that was what it was originally slated for. Um, briefly, it's about this, uh, it's not like a young woman. She, um, she's very unlucky in life, and then she kind of finds out that there's this whole secret world associated with luck and, and kind of karma and, and, uh, kismet and all that stuff, and it's, it's very much what, it, like, your kind of standard fantasy adventure here. Um, it comes from Skydance. Skydance is one that I'm not very familiar with, as most of you probably aren't. It's pretty new, um... Again, they kind of took John Lasseter on right after he left. Um, so this is like their kind of chance to... I mean, John is definitely going to try and redeem himself with this one. And I don't know. Because we haven't he been hearing too much about it, it's it's all one big question mark. I mean, we have some concept uh, sketches and some you know promotional art that looks pretty cool. Um, I don't know. It's one to, It's one to keep an eye on. And then, uh, again, that's, uh, that's February 18th that's coming out. And then, straight from Lasseter uh, to uh, his now mortal enemies, uh, Pixar is giving us Turning Red. Uh, Turning Red is coming out on March 11th. You have definitely seen the trailer for this. It is everywhere now. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's going to be on, um, I don't know if it's going to be on Disney Plus right away, but it's coming out in theaters on March 11th. Um, uh, just briefly, I've already talked about this film. But briefly, it's about May. Um, she is uh, kind of a girl who thinks that she has it all, 
And then she realizes that her family has a quirk where uh, once they go through puberty, they have the ability to turn into a giant red panda whenever they get too emotional. Um, I don't like going solely off of the trailer for this one. Again, like, my brain is, is, has been inundated with this, um, <laughs> this trailer and these lines and then the zoom in on the girl saying, my name's May and I do, I do what I want whenever I want. Um, I don't like to judge too much on that. I don't have, I, I feel like right now the narrative, at least what's being given to us, seems a tad confused. But I don't know. I mean, it looks great. All the Pixar films look great, and the and the movement looks very cool, and that's what I like. And I like Domi Shi. Um, you remember her from Bao, and I uh, that was one of my favorite, most recent shorts that they did. So it, Turning Red has everything going for it. I just I don't know. It's giving me it's giving me sensors on the back of my pretentious little neck, <laughs> saying that this one might be. Uh, I just don't know what it's going to be about and how it's going to go about doing it. Um, and then, so moving on, a month later, you get The Bad Guys uh, being directed by Pierre Perifel. Uh Again, another <laughs> another trailer you're probably seeing a lot of. Um, this one I was excited about. I talked about it, I don't know if I talked about it last week, but maybe the week before. I can't remember anymore. But it's from DreamWorks. It's the first DreamWorks film that I've been kind of excited for in a bit. Um, it's about a group of kind of, uh, bad guy animals, a wolf, a piranha, a tarantula, uh, uh, this is starting to, starting to sound a lot like Back to the Outback, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> but they're a gang of thieves, and they're forced to, uh, turn good, and, uh, it's about their kind of, how they redefine themselves in that. Um, it looks, it, I don't know if it necessarily looks like their funniest one, but the action looks pretty cool, and I like the voice cast, and I don't know, it's, it seems like... It seems like what Shrek felt like, right, when you first watched it, when you were seeing those trailers come out the first time around. It really felt like, oh, it's got that kind of edge that DreamWorks does well. And it's got the, you know, it's got all those great Kung Fu Panda animators and Shrek people working on it. I think it could be really good. Uh, again, that is April 22nd. Moving on, we've got DC Super Pets. Um, that's going to be out on May 20th. Its directors are Jared Stern and Sam Levine. Um, I wasn't crazy about this one. I'm not, look, I'm not your biggest superhero guy. I, I like them a lot. I've already talked about this, so I won't spend too much time. I like, I like Batman and, and, and Superman as much as the next guy, I suppose. I'm not, <laughs> I wouldn't be the kind of guy that, that goes for their pets. I, I haven't watched any of these characters before, so I'm kind of removed from that. And I said before, I think, I think the inclusion of Dwayne Johnson as the dog, the main dog, and Kevin Hart as the other dog, feels kind of like stunt casting that's going to take away from the actual movie, and it's just going to feel like another one of their one of their kind of buddy comedies, which is you know fine. Like I love those guys; I think they're really funny together. But like, I don't I don't know why this movie needed that. Um, but again, it's April. Uh, no, it's actually it's May twentieth. It comes out from Warner Bros. You'll you'll see a lot more of these trailers pretty soon, I imagine. Um, one that we haven't been getting too much uh, coverage on, just because it's been flip-flopping, uh, ironic pun intended there, is Bob's Burgers the Movies, um, or the movie, which will be coming out supposedly on May 27th. Um, we've been getting a lot of, you know, during the COVID, the COVID kind of initial era of shutdowns and whatnot, it wasn't really clear. There was a moment where we thought this thing was going to be canceled, but now it's back. Um... I like, look, I love Bob's Burgers. I love these characters. I actually think that, I think more than anything, like, these characters could do well with a TV movie um, or something like that. Like, Bob's Burgers is the closest thing that I feel like has come, a show has come to, like, the original season of The Simpsons, right? Those, those first great seasons. They feel very similar to me, um, just in tone. And, look, I loved The Simpsons movie. I felt like that was... I'm probably not alone here in thinking that, but I felt like that was probably the the the, the best last thing that The Simpsons did. Um, and so, I, look, I hope that this movie, the Bob's Burgers movie, isn't the same fate for that, for Bob's Burgers. But, um, yeah, it's coming out on May 27th. I think it could be good. I think this one might be one to keep an eye on. Um, then there's another one that we've talked about before, Lightyear with Buzz Lightyear from uh, Chris Evans playing him. 
that's uh, another Pixar. So we've gotten two Pixar films pretty closely back to back. Um, that's going to be on June 17th. I'm not going to talk too much more. We already know this one. This is Angus McLean is directing it. It's from Pixar. It looks very cool. Um, look, I, I didn't like Finding Dory very much. That's maybe my least favorite Pixar movie. Um, <laughs> watch me start a, a fire war in the comments <laughs> about that one. No, I really didn't like Finding Dory. Um, and that's McLean's like big credit. He was the co-director on that. But I don't know. I have, I have faith with this one. I, I, I actually got pretty welled up watching the trailer. Like I think a lot of us did. I think redesigning Buzz is a cool move. Um, you know, I do I think Buzz needed his own movie? No, but I if it goes the route of like Buzz from the, you know, Buzz Lightyear Star Command, that could be cool. That's kind of a different character and property altogether. So I I don't know. I I've got high hopes for that one. Then there's Minions the Rise of Gru. That's July 1st. Uh it's directed by Kyle uh, Balda. Um <laughs> I um Look, the Minions is is like Illumination's best. Like that was one of their best selling movies of all time, right? And I don't really get why I didn't see it. So it's not like I guess I don't really have a lot of place to judge. I have a friend who's crazy about the Minions, and he thinks this one will be even better than the last one. So look, it's it's. If you like this, you like it, and if you don't, you don't need to watch it. But it is, at least, at least it's tied into building up the character of Gru, right? The last one didn't have anything to do with besides the minions. So, you know, maybe, maybe it'll be something like an ex exciting prequel to see where he comes from. Um, okay, moving on, here's another one that we haven't heard too much from. It's Under the Boardwalk. It's directed by David Soren. Uh, it's from Paramount Animation and Paramount Pictures. That's going to come out on July 22nd. Um, it's from the same folks, I mean, you know Soren from Captain Underpants, uh, the first epic movie, which, did they ever do? <laughs> I, there was never a second epic movie, I don't think. <laughs> but from the, but from what we're reading, what we're getting of what this movie is, I don't know, it's really weird. Like, it's got, it's a, it's like a musical comedy about hermit crabs, and they're, like, talking like they're from Jersey Shore, and it's supposed to be kind of like, it's supposed to have tones from Romeo and Juliet were like the like the native like hermit crabs are doing battle against the the tourist crabs and like two of them fall in love um so I mean look it feels it sounds ridiculous so it could either be really good or really bad like I when I hear something like this it makes me kind of think of something like storks which um was like you saw the trailer so much, and the premise was so ridiculous, and you, I kept thinking, I'm like, this is gonna be so bad, and it turned into, like, one of my favorite movies of the year. Look at me, look at, look at me distinguishing myself as a man of taste, saying I hated Finding Dory, but I liked Storks, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, this is Under the Boardwalk, it's from the same people, uh, D-N-N, D-N-E-G, um, it's from their younger animation unit, um, those are the people that gave you Ron's Gone Wrong. So this is kind of their second outing. They're going to show, hey, maybe is this is this a, something, a, a production company to pay attention to in this realm? I don't know. They're, you know, Ron's Gone Wrong did okay. And so I think they're kind of showing themselves off here. That's uh, Under the Boardwalk. Then there's Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. That's going, coming out on September 23rd. It's coming from director Joel Crawford. Uh, Puss in Boots is obviously DreamWorks. This has been... Uh, this is like a long time. Oh my gosh. Push it, Puss in Boots came out in what? Like 2010, 11, 12. This is long time coming. Um, um, but yes, this is the, and this is the sequel spinoff of that character. Um, this is, this is like the first time we've gotten this in a while. Wow. Like, uh, I wonder, I don't know if we're supposed to have any Shrek in this movie. I think it might just be Puss in Boots. But this, yes, this is more of that character. This is more of his um, his world. I imagine, I don't know what fairy tale we're getting from this one. But it will be more, it will be more of Puss in Boots. Which is great. Like, look, I, as a kid, I love Puss in Boots was my favorite character. So I, I and I liked the movie okay. I, I can't remember. Was it nominated for an Oscar? This is a very loose episode, guys. I'm not... Look, I don't have my information pulled up in front of me as I talk. Um, 
<laughs> but yes, so more Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. This is your first little taste of Shrek in a very long time. Then, this is the one that everybody's pulling for, right? This is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse Part 1 will come out October 7th. It's from directors uh, Joaquin Dos Santos, Kemp Powers, and Justin K. Thompson. Um, it's more of Sony, you know, yeah, Sony makes these. This one looks pretty damn cool. Um, I talked about it before, so I won't go too far, but this is kind of what I was hoping Spider-Man, uh, Into the Spider-Verse would be. It looks like it's Spider-Man kind of traveling across these different realms, and it's coming right on the back of, uh, No Way Home, which it really explored that territory. I think this is very, very cool. He's fighting, you know, Miles looks a little older. He's fighting um, what looks like another version of Spider-Man, at least to me. Um, maybe it's some realm of Venom, I'm not sure. But the fact that it's part one, too, like, that's, they're really, they're being pretty, <laughs> they're being pretty um, ambitious with this one. They've also said, some of the producers, like Amy Pascal, um, promised us that there would be a, more of a romantic focus between Miles and Gwen with this one. Um... Which makes sense. I think they were kind of holding off on that because they were younger and because those characters were still fresh and they were introducing everything. So we'll see. Like, I think this is a, I think this could be pretty cool and what they do with it. I'm excited. Now, moving on to an ambitious project from Disney. This is coming out on November 23rd. It's from Don Hall, director, and from Disney. Uh, it's Strange World. Um, this one is, uh, is an interesting, this is going to be Disney's only movie for 2022. Um, so they're kind of, I think they're kind of doubling down with this one, and they're definitely doubling down with this, with the, the kind of action-adventure thing that we saw a little bit from Raya, um, and yes, Don Hall was the director of Raya, so it makes sense that they're bringing him back on. They also have the co-writer from, um, Raya, which is Kwai, uh, Kwai Nguyen, sorry if I got your name wrong, uh, Kwai, <laughs> um, but it, it is, like, they're, I think Disney might have seen what some of these really big action adventure films of the last couple of years have taken them, have, have done, and they're kind of interested in doubling down on that. This is a, this is a kind of space odyssey about a family of the, the Clades, um, that's their name, and they're, like, legendary space explorers or whatnot, but they're in this... Un, like unexplored planet that's kind of all we've gotten we've got some concept art that looks very cool looks kind of like um i don't know it's 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 weird it doesn't look very disney and i i can't imagine that this is what it will ultimately look like i i i wonder about this one i if disney plays it a little risky and tries something new i think it could be really good but if they fall back on their roots of kind of older fashioned story structure and like i don't know kind of that same style of animation, which is is admittedly really good, but I don't know. I don't know if it would work for this. I'm I'm cautiously optimistic with Strange World. Then there's uh, the un <laughs> then there's the Super Mario movie. I'm not even going to talk about that one. That's Aaron Harvath and Michael uh, Jelinek. Um, that's coming out on December 21st. We don't even have a name yet. It is literally just being sold on its cast and that it's Mario. I I don't have high hopes, but maybe maybe. But that's everything with a slated release, right, for 2022. I'm not, there's a lot of other ones. There's, like, we have Guillermo del Toro's uh, Pinocchio. That's going to be really exciting. There's Blazing Samurai. That's going to be really exciting. Um, but we don't have official release dates on those yet, so I'm not going to cover those just yet. Instead, I'm going to move on because I'm already, to like, 25 minutes into this video. Um, I'm going to talk about anime. So in the, in the world, I'll just do two for anime because we're... <laughs> I'm so behind. This is going to be such a messy episode. Um, in anime films, uh, to hit you next year, right, the two big ones to keep in mind uh, out of the sea of upcoming anime releases are Dragon Ball Super, Super Hero, and um, uh, Doraemon, Nobita's Little Star Wars. Uh, that's 2021, but In a Cruel Twist of Fate is coming out in 2022. I'll talk about that one in just a bit. But for Dragon Ball Super Super Hero, um, that is coming out April 22nd, 2022 in Japan. We don't have an American release date yet, but I imagine you'll be able to get streamings of the Japanese version wherever you stream uh, anime. It's a sequel, I've already talked about this one before, but it's a sequel to the 2018 Dragon Ball Super Brawly. Uh, Super Hero takes place after the conclusion of the Boo Saga. The story that we've gotten so far is that an evil corporation has revived the notorious Red Ribbon Army and has constructed two new androids, uh, Gamma 1 and Gamma 2. 
Their sole purpose is to seek out vengeance on Goku for his acts against their android brethren from the Cell Saga. The promotional material that we've gotten gave us a look at some of the characters, uh, like Gamma 1 and Gamma 2, which look very cool. I wonder what the... I don't, I don't know exactly what the dynamic is going to be. It'd probably be similar to the androids from before. Um, but we also got looks at 3D models uh, from special characters that might be a focus of the movie, like uh, Krillin, Pan, and uh, Piccolo. Krillin's probably going to get a spotlight in the narrative because of his relationship with Android 18. Um... Well, the trailer also, you know, the trailer showcased Pan, uh, Goku's granddaughter. It looks like she's going to be kind of going through that that Gohan. Um, remember when Gohan was a kid and he did, like, the little baby training with Piccolo? It kind of looks like that's going to be what's going on with Pan. Um, so, yeah, so it'll be a Piccolo and Pan kind of focused narrative. And there's, like, in the trailer, I told, I talked about this before, but there's, like, this little guy who looks like a spoiled, like, super powerful baby or something like that. I imagine Pan will probably be doing battle with him. Um, one other thing to keep in mind with this, even though this is, like, the 21st Dragon Ball feature film, it's the only one, it's actually the first one in the whole franchise that is using a majority of 3D CGI animation. So... Uh, look, I'm kind of interested in what that might look and do regarding the look and the change of things. I don't know, it could be. Remember, it's coming out on in Japan on April 22nd in 2022. Okay, so next is uh, Doraemon, Nobita's Little Star Wars 2021, <laughs> coming out on March 4th, 2022. Um, as the name suggests, Nobita's Little Star Wars 2021 is a remake of the 1985 Doraemon film of the same name, which was itself a parody of... You guessed it, Star Wars. Um, the plot consists of Nobita finding a teeny tiny little alien named Poppy. Um, <laughs> uh, it's such a cute, it's so cute. Um, a little alien named Poppy who comes to Earth attempting to escape an evil army taking over his home planet uh, of Pirika. Um, very much Star Wars in that kind of theming. Uh, but when the alien army shows up to attack Earth and get uh, Poppy back, it's up to Doraemon and Nobita and all that gang to save the planet and save Poppy. The film is being directed by Susumu Yamaguchi, uh, who has plenty of Doraemon credits under his belt. Like, seriously, he's directed several of these and worked in the art department, as well as other anime titles. And the script comes from Dai Sato, who... Um, He's written for so many of your favorite classic anime, it's like it would probably make your head spin. Um, so we're in good hands with this one. If you can tell from the title, the film was originally slated to debut uh, this past year. But of course, with the world of uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic, the film had to be postponed to March of 2022. But you know, here at the Animation Podcast, <laughs> we'd like to say when it comes to our remakes of satires and parodies of Star Wars, better late than never, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> Finally, just to take a break from upcoming movie news and whatnot, um, in a fun little crossover between news sections, I can report that Summertime Rendering, the mystery anime series adapted from writer and uh, illustrator Yasuki Tanaka, will be making its way to Disney Plus in April of next year. I've spoken on Summertime Rendering before, but as a reminder, the manga-turned-anime series focuses on a young man returning to his isolated hometown on an island um, to visit, uh, to, I guess, to attend an old friend's funeral. Of course, once he gets there, Shimpai, our protagonist, finds out that his vacation home may be just about a living nightmare. Um, it's it's an odd pick for Disney, no doubt, uh, as this their mysteries are usually being solved by mice detectives, but the platform is very eager to widen its anime menu, so this may very well be a win-win for everybody involved. I'm not sure if Disney Plus will ever be the place to go to for anime, at least I don't know if it will ever be like the popular one for it, but it's certainly trying to get its foot in the, ga in the game. Okay, uh, moving on to animation around the world, here are, some, here are five uh, animated movies to keep an eye on that are coming out this next year that I think that you should, you know, maybe pay attention to. Um, Charlotte, for one. Charlotte uh, is coming from Belgium and France and Spain. It's uh, coming to theaters in the U.S. on April 22nd, 2022. That's the <laughs> same day as Dragon Ball Super Superhero comes out. Um, Charlotte Solomon is a name you might be familiar with. She was a young painter in her mid-twenties whose life was very tragically taken away from us too soon in a concentration camp during the Nazi regime. 
She is mostly remembered in the modern day now through her beloved autobiographical paintings and now, also now, uh, through the upcoming biopic directed by Eric War Warren and Tahir Rana. Um, so far, the only one, it's going to be the only one of these films that I'm talking about that actually has a U.S. theatrical run planned. The movie's uh, titular character is going to be voiced by Kira Knightley, and you can watch it in a theater near you come April 22nd. Um, <laughs> again, same day as Dragon Ball Super Super comes out. Another exciting name that you might be familiar with with some animation coming their way is uh, Haruki Murakami. Um, Blind with Willow, Sleeping Woman, from Luxembourg, Netherlands, France, and Canada, is going to be releasing sometime in the earlier half of 2022. Fans of short or speculative fiction probably know Murakami already. Um, this is an oft-adapted series of short stories, um, that is making its way to an upcoming animated anthology. This is the first time the writer's works will be interpreted in an animated medium, and if you can't already tell from the trailer, the form and the filling might be a perfect fit for one another. If you haven't already pulled two and two together, Blind Willow's Sleeping Woman is a European production and extrapolation from a Japanese source from Japanese source material, something that we saw done to great effect earlier this year with Summon of the Gods. The movie is going to be directed by uh, Pierre Foldes, or Folds, uh, not really sure how you say this one, it's got an umlaut over the O, <laughs> um, and it will combine the, uh, several of Murakami's stories into one overarching narrative about a handful of protagonists dealing with the sea, what seems to be a devastating and inevitable earthquake coming in Japan. The animation itself is strange and eerie and fantastical in all the ways that Murakami's writing has been praised for. If you are a fan of the writer or innovative storytelling, I have a feeling this one is going to be for you. Um, also, when it comes to innovative storytelling, my grandfather used to say he saw demons. No, that is not me admitting something about my grandfather. It is a new movie coming up, which is from a joint collaboration from countries like France, Spain, and Portugal and it will come out in June of 2022. This is the first feature film from director Nuno Bito, who caught the world's attentions a couple in the last couple of years uh, with his short film My uh, Life is in Your Hands and other ones that he's done. We don't know much about the story itself other than um, it's the trailer is noticeably free of any and all dialogue, but from what you can see in the footage shown, it's about a woman feeling trapped in her busy life in the city and by mistakes from her past, who attempts to clear her mind by visiting a small forest cottage, presumably one that was formerly owned by her recently deceased grandfather. When immediate, what immediately grabs your attention you know, for, in watching something like this is that uh, is this art style. Uh, Beto marks his story beats by shifting back and forth between a blurry, energetic 2D realm with the cityscapes within the cityscape to a subdued and grounded stop-motion claymation world of the forest. Definitely, it's definitely one to keep your eye on for claymation fans. It looks very cool how they shift back and forth, like. A movie with just one of these styles would be exciting enough, but the fact that they go back and forth, it's pretty cool. Now, I'm going to give you two last ones uh, that are very exciting. Um, after a production process that has spanned over 10 years, the movie derived from Chris Grind's graphic novel series Chicken Hair will finally be coming to us from France. Way back in 2011 um, was when we first heard that Dark Horse Comics and Sony had announced their intentions of adapting the dark comedy series about the chicken-rabbit hybrid and his bearded turtle friend <laughs> on an adventure through hell and back. The movie was uh, was re was written and then rewritten and then re rewritten until it was ultimately canceled in 2020 in 2016, only to be brought back to life again in 2021 with the new name uh, Chicken Hair and the Hamster of Darkness. Um, it's got directors Ben uh, Ben Stassen and Matthew Zeller attached, and Dave Collard or uh, Collard. I'm not sure <laughs> if he's French or not. Um, Dave Collard is writing the screenplay. The movie is slated for some time in mid to late of next year. Uh, seeing something like this, just for me, it gives all of us animation wannabes and hopefuls some real faith that no matter how many setbacks you face, if you keep pushing and believing and building the project, there is room for you in this medium. And I, I'm very excited for this. I, I like the comic books. I actually read them. Uh, I read them way back when. So I think this will be very, very cool. 
Um, and then lastly, a movie I'm particularly interested in. France and Spain might be giving us the most whack job, gory, and fascinating story of 2022 in Alberto Vasquez's Unicorn Wars. <laughs> Um, it's an animated opus uh, depicting a Vietnam War-esque military conflict between teddy bears and unicorns. Um, <laughs> the movie is a total condemnation of violence using the most adorable Im imagery available. Um, it is surreal, it's a satire that its creators describe as Apocalypse Now meets Bambi, um, and from the trailer, that is, like, spot on. Um, some of the moments that are showcased seem like this twisted combination of hilarious and downright disturbing, uh, which comes as no surprise to anyone who has followed Vasquez's career, particularly with his feature Bird Boy, The Forgotten Child, and shorts like, uh, Decorado under his belt. Um, there isn't a precise date for this film's release, um, as of now, but it is still expected sometime in next year, and you guys should check out the trailer. It's actually, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I say that, it's pretty cool, guys. Check it out. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, moving on, moving on. In home video and digital HD releases, in the realm of circular things that go that you can pay to go spinning, um, we've got a whole lot of uh, end-of-the-year Blu-ray and home video release news and reminders. So, um, say you wanted to start your new year with a spooky little road trip, there isn't a better time to pre-order yourself a copy of The Addams Family 2, which will be coming out for digital and home purchasing on January 18th of 2022. Picking up after the first movie, the sequel focuses on the creepy and kooky parents, Morticia and Gomez, um, attempting to reconnect with their children, Wednesday and Pugsley, on a cross-country road trip. Um, but say, maybe you want, you like the darker aesthetic, but want something that's actually good. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I have nothing against the Addams Family, I, uh, you know, I just didn't watch that one. Um, say you want something that takes itself a little more seriously, perhaps. Um, the Batman, the complete series, uh, the remastered, uh, 2004 take on a, uh, the Cape Crusader will be available for do-gooders and ne'er-do-wells alike in, on February 1st. That's gonna be the complete series of that 2004 series. Um, but maybe you like the action but would rather do a little, uh, have it be a little more stylized. Well, you're in luck. Because eighth, the eighth season of Rooster Teeth's smash hit anime series, Ruby, is already out now, just begging for you to enjoy those signature fight scenes while you're out here fighting for your life in the new year, on New Year's Eve, or in the new year. Oh boy. I really, I really wrote whatever I wanted, didn't I? Um, okay. But maybe, maybe you don't trust any of this new stuff, right? And you just want a classic to bring in the new year. Well, look no further, because the end of all be, the end all be all of all anime movies, Akira, is coming out on 4K, uh, Ultra HD Blu-ray on January 18th. Same day as The Addams Family 2, which will no doubt have the exact same cultural impact as Akira when we look back years from now. <laughs> Or look, maybe you just don't want to buy anything, and in which case, you don't have to buy anything. Maybe you just want to hear me talk about some singing animals. Well, have I got a surprise for you. Yes, I did go to the theater to watch Sing 2. I went at 11 a.m. like an absolute madman. <laughs> I was maybe one of four people to see it. And I looked insane buying my ticket that early in the morning, but that was the only time that I could go and see it. Um, yes, Sing 2. Let's give you a little bit of some general stuff. You probably already know this, um, but it's uh, directed by Garth Jennings. He, um, he wrote stuff like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Son of Rambo. Um, it's also directed by him, direct, written and directed. He directed those things as well. It's being produced by Chris Melandondri and Janet Healy. They did... They're kind of the Illumination people, honestly. They're like the Despicable Me folks. They did. They've got a lot under their belt. Um, it stars. It's got that all-star cast. It's got Matthew McConaughey, Tori Kelly, Reese Witherspoon, um, Taron Egerton, Bobby Cannavale. He's the bad guy in it. I love Bobby Cannavale. I, I'd watch most things that he voices. Um, let me let, let me get right into it. Right. Sing 2 is an odd bird in a lot of ways. Um, it's like a picture-perfect recreation of the first one, which just with even bigger style, you know? And in even more ways, it's the exact same movie as before, but this time, zero stakes and zero character development. That sounds mean, but it's going to be the shape of this whole thing, right? So I know a lot of, a lot of like... 
film, YouTube, and analysis channels were sort of turned off. They turned their noses up at the first Sing movie, dismissing it as some kind of shallow corporate formula film that distracts away from the lack of substance with musical numbers. Um, that's not necessarily wrong. Um, I feel like I might be in the minority with this one. I actually liked Sing, the first Sing movie. I thought that was, I thought it was pretty good, even though I knew what it was doing and what Illumination was doing with it. I thought the characters were charming and heartfelt and the songs were exciting. And coming from a showbiz background myself, I enjoyed seeing something that really felt like it honored that theater kid that most of us have deep inside. So... Since I liked the first one, right, and the second one is pretty much the same movie, that probably means that I liked this one, right? Let's talk about the story. <laughs> Both Sing movies recycle a lot of the same beats. They focus on a small-town artistic director, Buster Moon, the Matthew McConaughey koala, a uh, brief tangent, but how crazy is it that this koala sounds literally nothing like Matthew McConaughey, right? Like, that's it's crazy that he is the guy who voices him, um, at least to me. Moon is hit with some kind of bad news, and then in an attempt to save his skin, fabricates a fantastical story to con convince an authority figure into helping him. The rest of the movie is spent focusing on four smaller subplots between Moon's cast, all dealing with personal issues, as Moon himself tries to turn his lie into a reality. That is the Sing blueprint. You can now make any Sing movie you want, knowing that there are steps that you can follow. <laughs> this time around, Moon is told by a big-time talent scout that he and his cast don't have what it takes to make it in the Red Shore in Red Shore City, which seems kind of like the Sing universe's equivalent to Vegas or something like that. Moon sneaks his cast into, a, into an audition for Jimmy Crystal, the Bobby Cannavale wolf, who is the entertainment mogul who kind of runs Red Shore, Vegas, City, or whatever, right? Um, Moon tricks the wolf, Crystal is the wolf, um, into thinking that they have some big flashy musical starring Clay Calloway, a reclusive ex-rock star who mysteriously disappeared 15 years ago. And because of that, Crystal gives them a shot, and the movie's off and running. Moon struggles to kind of create the big musical that he doesn't actually have, while the cast members all deal with their different things, and they all try and convince Clay Calloway to come back on into the spotlight when they said that they had him when they didn't, right? When it comes to a movie like Sing, or Sing 2, there are really only two aspects that are important. It's characters, and it's the spectacle. That's what matters, right? Let's, you know, let's be realistic. That's what matters when it comes to making something like this. In the first thing, um, the movie works in my opinion because each of the characters are almost entirely defined by an incredibly strong want. The Terran Egerton gorilla wants to find himself out of, outside of his dad's plans for him. The Reese Witherspoon pig wants to chase after a dream she feels she gave up in motherhood, etc., etc., right? These are exciting stories about self-actualization that the communal goal of putting on a show lifts up. All the songs come from those characters fighting for their passions. When you see Scarlett Johansson Porcupine shred on the guitar or Tori Kelly Elephant like belting and doing the riffs and fireworks and light shows are going off in the background, your heartstrings get pulled because that's how we know, that's what we know achieving your passion feels like, you know? That's the, the spectacle is supporting the characters. But in Sing 2, those characters have, for the most part, gotten what they set out to do in the first time around. The movie finds itself in a difficult position. It would, very, very, it would be very, very easy to make a movie about small-town performers feeling like they're out of their league and that they lose their confidence, but because the series has already made a movie, it's already, those, that storyline is already under its belt, um, it really couldn't go that route again. So it gives the characters very surface-level problems. Taron E. Gorilla... <laughs> <laughs> Taron E. Gorilla has to dance in the musical, but he doesn't know how to dance. Or Reese Witherpig is supposed to do a big jump off a high dive, but she's afraid of heights. The movie knows that its characters don't have those personal stakes in the game as much as they did the first time around, um, because, you know, the Gorilla Kid never cared about dancing before. He doesn't even care about it all that much to begin with now, but he feels like he has to do it because it's part of his job, you know? So what, the, what can Sing 2 do? Well, they double down on the spectacle. 
there are more songs and they are bigger and flashier than before. And in a lot of cases, you do get a pretty you do get pretty wowed, especially in the third act, where a lot of the buildup for what the show that they're putting on is actually going to be has its payoff. The musical numbers are just wow. But as I was marveling at some of those sequences, I felt a little hollow because they weren't motivated by character or wants behind most of them, you know? Yeah, there's a brief catharsis when a character can do something that they couldn't do before, but, like, why are they doing these things in the first place? In Sing's 2 case, it's almost entirely because the story needed them to have something that they needed to do in the big final sequence. This time around, the characters are supporting the spectacle, and it doesn't work half as well. Also, and th I promise this is my last, like, story note, right? But Buster Moon isn't half as likable this time around. In the first movie, it's clear from, like, the get-go that he's kind of a hustler and says whatever he needs to say to get what he wants, but it feels like it's coming from a place of love, you know? When he pushed characters out of their comfort zone or guilted them into doing something, yeah, it was kind of a scummy move, but he was doing it to help them get past their mental barriers and get them to a place where they wanted to be. This time around, he does all that same stuff, but again, it's like not in the service of the characters, it's in the service of this big fancy show that they're putting on. So, like a lot of the time, Buster Moon just kind of comes off as this boss who doesn't listen to his cast and is a little manipulative, so... <laughs> And look, manipulative actually is a good word for the movie. Not in a bad way, but the emotions that it draws out of you while you're watching are not earned through story. They are wrung out of you like a wet dishcloth by spectacle and the human being's primal response to beauty and music. Now look, as far as the animation goes, it's pretty much par for the course with the last one. The characters look and move the same, they just have showier things going on around them. And there are some truly, like, amazing images and sequences that come out of the musical numbers. Again, like, especially towards the end. There's some dancing, too, which I thought was exciting enough. Um, it, but it doesn't really come close to how great the dancing and movement was in something like Encanto. Um, but there's something, there's something charming about how all these animals move much more like humans would, and I also like that the, uh, the bigger animals felt like they had real weight to them, and the smaller ones had a lightness about them. Everything feels very kid-friendly and round, which is kind of what you'd expect from Illumination. They hardly ever veer away from that. And I'm not the biggest fan of the studios doing tons of, like, fur textures on animated characters. This movie wasn't too egregious with that, though they do have, like, Maybe four or so occasions when Buster Moon gets, like, wet or soaked, and his little wet koala fur texture definitely skeeved me out a little bit. I also feel like I should briefly talk about the songs. This is totally subjective, right? But it didn't feel to me like there were as many bangers. <laughs> um, I don't know. Again, that's pretty subjective. But if you, I, I might have to go back and rewatch the first one. Sing 2 has, like a ton of songs, but hardly any of them are actually this, they're not sung to their completion. completion. Um, there's also a couple of times where they have a song that really didn't fit what was going on. Like, there was a scene where the characters are sneaking into the agent's building, and they start playing Bad Guy by Billie Eilish. It could be just because that song is used a lot in animation trailers and in animated movies and TV shows nowadays, but it felt really, like, shoehorned in there. Like, it didn't work with what was going on and there was another this was this actually had my jaw was on the floor with this i you know this i might just be too in tune with internet stuff or whatever but there was a moment where they had a montage that had it was like an emotional montage where the gang is like getting the whole show to come together and they play they play this song from the grubhub commercial like the one that the internet couldn't stand <laughs> and you can't even focus on what's going on because you're like, are they really playing this song? Even if you don't know what is going, like you don't know the context behind that song, it doesn't work with what's going on. It's that it's like kind of poppy and tonal and tinny and annoying. Like, I don't know why they were using that for this really kind of emotional moment. Um, that being said, there is a moment when a snail that looks like Drake sings Hotline Bling, so the movie cannot be that bad. <laughs> um, as I wrap this all up, I find myself in a little critic's dilemma, right? Do I fault a movie for making me feel something through the use of techniques like animated spectacle and music instead of through a more thoughtful narrative effort? Or 
do I give it credit for achieving exactly what it wanted to do in making me feel a certain way? After all, bigger, more beloved movies have used the exact same idea, the same music to conjure emotion before and will continue to do so. If I love something like Ratatouille or C- Coco, and I know I say Ratatouille weird. Everybody I know comments about that. But, <laughs> but if I love something like the music in Ratatouille or in Coco, using soundtracks to get me to well up inside, can I really be mad when audiences cheer for Reese Witherspoon Pig when she hits the high notes and break free while saving the day? I'm genuinely not sure. So I'm going to ride a line a little bit and give Sing a 2.7 out of 5. That could maybe fall upwards into being a 3, but then I would retroactively make Encanto's score a little higher. I can't remember what I gave that one. If it's a 3, then I should be giving it a 3.5 after Sing 2. Um, yeah, and that's it. Gosh, this is the longest one I've ever done. Um, that's the end of the, that's the end of review. Um, I'm 50 minutes in. I don't, I don't have a recommendation this week that I really feel strongly about. You know what I should, I would say, this will be good actually. Uh, if you want to watch my top 10 list that's coming out in a couple of days, I advise, I recommend that you go and you watch, um, Batman The Long Halloween. I'll be talking about that, not to spoil anything. Um, I will be talking about Luca. I will be talking about a lot of the big movies this year. Um, so yeah, my my pick of the week would be, why don't you go and watch Batman The Long Halloween? Because I will be talking about that in a little bit. Um, okay, okay, this is the end of the episode, right? So, thank you for listening to this episode of the Animation Podcast. Be sure to like this episode and subscribe. You can find more of my work on Filmbook. That's film-book.com. Um, just search E from Bernie or the Animation Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at Frumblers or on Instagram at E from Burning. If you would like to contact us, you can email us at podcast at film book.com with the Animation Podcast in the subject line. Tune in next week for the latest episode of the Animation Podcast and all things animation. Thank you for listening. I'll see you then and Happy New Year. Let's have a good 2022, Epic Voice Man. Send us off. Thanks for listening to the Animation Podcast. Find more of the Animation Podcast on Filmbook, on your favorite podcast service, and on YouTube.